Yes. No, not here. Yeah. said that today after class I would be doing a, a review session. Um, I want to know whether you guys want to do that today like, or whether you would prefer to do that on Monday after class, which would give you the weekend to look at the review problems. Monday. 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 Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. <laughs> I, was, I was up till 5 a.m. working on my 450-page thesis, so I didn't quite. <laughs> Go through the problems myself yet either. Uh, all right. Um, cool. Then today uh, we're gonna. Today's uh, fairly light on uh, the equations for change. Uh, we're gonna be going through sort of uh, what keeps us naval architects in business. All right. Uh, that has it's 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 all of the theory that underpins. Model testing, why towing tanks work, right? Why, uh, why, why models in general give us real-world insights <laughs> to problems. And so, um, <clears throat> actually, we're probably only going to hit the first bullet point here today, which is uh, the idea of dimensional analysis. So, as I showed in the last couple of lectures, um, we can, you know, we we understand what's going on in a fluid, right? We understand what the physics are, usually. We say there's viscosity, there are pressures, there's uh, the, the inertial components of a, of a fluid's motion, and so we understand how those make individual fluid elements move, or the fluid move as a continuum. We can write out the equations. So we have these great mathematical models, but we don't have the mathematical tools to solve those equations in general. We only have a a small selection of problems that are simple enough that we can do the math directly. So the analysis only takes us so far. Um, anything beyond flow over a flat plate and laminar flow, things that are simple like that, require us to supplement our analysis with some empirical or experimental insight. So um, for example, things as simple as <laughs> Uh, streamlines or streak lines over road vehicles, air quality testing involving uh, the dispersion of, of pollutants and smokestacks over giant model scale cities, to things like the aerodynamic analysis of uh, high speed aircraft. Um, and what's interesting about these is that they're all, you know, they all look like the systems that they're supposed to represent, right? Looks like a train, looks like a city, looks like a plane, but they are distinctly different in the sense that much smaller, much smaller, much smaller, and in water instead of in air, right? And so there's a theory behind why we can actually do this, why we can take something that isn't what we're studying and still get scalable results. <coughs> All right, 
so the, 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 the idea here is that, as I've said, a lot of flow problems we can't tackle with theory alone. So we have to do experiments, um, which requires that, A, we know how to plan those experiments intelligently, and we know how to interpret the results, how to correlate those results, and to solve uh, the problem that we're looking at. And then often, because experiments tend to be quite expensive, we try to make the results as generally applicable as possible. If you're trying to, uh, you know, if you're trying to uh, experimentally determine what the, what the flow through a pipe looks like, you don't want to have to run 100 experiments for each different uh, diameter of pipe that you're going to be using in a, in a hydraulic system. You'd rather come up with some sort of insight that lets you understand how the fluid is going to flow through every possible pipe diameter that you'll encounter. And so this comes down to this idea of similitude. And we'll be, we'll be getting back to this uh, at the end of today's talk. Uh, so let's get into what, what dimensional analysis actually means. So I just mentioned the idea of flow through a pipe as a motivating example. So imagine that we're interested in the pressure drop, that is, uh, the, the amount of pressure loss between two points in a smooth-walled circular pipe with steady flow. Uh, this, is a, this is an extremely simple problem in a lot of ways. There's no gravitational influence. It's steady. It's axisymmetric. We can assume that it's laminar. And we may expect our... Uh, our total pressure drop, that is the difference in pressure between two points, uh, divided by the length of uh, the, the distance between those. We may expect it to depend on the pipe diameter, on the fluid density, on the fluid viscosity, and on the speed of the flow through the pipe. Right? Those are four reasonable parameters that we could probably envision as part of the solution. Unfortunately, we don't know what this actual solution is. We can't. This is one, an example of one of those problems where there isn't a mathematical, ex, mathematically exact solution for it. And so we have to bring experiments into the uh, into play here. Um, and we've all been taught since you know our our first grade school science fairs that the way you do. Science is to look at one variable at a time, right? You, you hold everything constant and you perturb your, your equation somehow, and through the scientific method you say, I now understand the effect of variable A because I've held variable B, C, D constant and varied A across a range of values. Um, but that's not a good practice here. And the reason for that is, for example, if we held each of the each of the four um, independent variables constant in turn and varied the other one. For example, varied the velocity, varied the diameter, varied the viscosity, varied the fluid density, while the other three are constant. We would get these four curves, okay? But it's not that generally applicable because what if I wanted this curve with a slightly different value of V, right? I have to go through and I have to take another five data points so for the case shown here, just to get these four curves requires that I run 20 experiments. Okay? If I want to get a broad space, that is, if I have, if I have uh, the example here, if I have 10 values of each variable and I want to understand every possible combination of those 10 values, that's going to require that I run 10,000 experiments. So it's this, 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 this power law right, that says that the total number of experiments you have to do to run a full factorial, as it's called, where you look at every combination, every permutation of the, uh, of the uh, variables, it follows the, the law that the number of experiments is going to be equal to the, uh, let's see, the, the number of points you're interested in raised to the number of variables. So, you can see, I just finished running experiments that involved five different, dimension, or five different dimensional parameters as governing, uh, or as, as independent uh, variables. And each one of those, I was testing it anywhere between 3 and 20 values. 
right? And if I had done a full factorial on my own experiments, it would have required I do something closer to 100,000 experiments. <coughs> it's a lot of time in the towing tank. I know, I did 1,000, but... Uh, um, as, and as a kicker here, and a really practical concern, experiments tend to be pretty expensive. So when you're talking about planning experiments, someone's got to pay for them. And for example, if you're at the MHL, if you're an outside company that wants to use the towing tank here in Michigan, you're looking at paying 2,500 bucks a day just for access. <coughs> I went to a free surface cavitation tunnel in Italy. Right? They were nice enough to donate a facility time. But if uh, they hadn't, and we'd been an outside commercial interest, we would have been looking at paying 9000 a day. The Navy has the large cavitation channel in Memphis, Tennessee, the largest in the world. Right? If you were an outside interest that wants to test there, you're looking at 20000 a day. And you know how many experiments you can do in a day? Like five. <laughs> All right? Let's this over five. 2000. 2000 times 20000. You're looking at a really, really big paycheck to understand pipe flow. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not good. Um, so the ticket here is to say, all right, if there's a way I can reduce the number of experiments that I have to run, it's going to make everybody happy. And the way we do so is through this seemingly magical application of... Uh, what we call dimensional analysis. So we've said, all right, the drop in pressure is equal to some unknown function of the pipe diameter, the viscosity, the fluid density, and the fluid velocity. That's fine. That means we essentially have five variables, right? One, two, three, four, five. All independent, dependent. Um, now if we're kind of tricky with this and we, we decide that we want to reorganize these variables in a specific way, what we can do is turn this relationship through a rigorous uh, theoretical process into this relationship, where phi here just stands in for f. It's, a, it's another functional relationship, right? And so what's great about this is that now instead of four independent parameters we have one independent <coughs> parameter, or one independent variable, and it's just a special group of all these right here. Now, um, the other thing about this version over on the right is that if we do a dimensional analysis on each of these, we'll see that they're dimensionless. We've canceled out all of the dimensions, making them independent of the units that we're looking at. Finally, what's great about this is because they're dimensionless, this means that if you wanted to test a bigger pipe, right? If you want, if you want to test a pipe of a larger diameter, then if, and if, or let's say, okay, let me start over. If you go into the lab and you test a model pipe and you test the pressure drop with this uh, and, and plug in these values of the variables and get a, uh, a number for some given rho, V, D, and mu, and then you want to get some insight about the flow through a larger pipe, you just say, okay, I know this value for the small pipe and I know this value for the small pipe. And because there are no dimensions associated with them, they have to be the same for a larger pipe, right? So if you plug in a larger D, then you just say, all right, now if I want to know the velocity at which this result holds for, some, for the same density and uh, viscosity, then I just reduce the value of V in the big pipe and now I know I already have the solution to this, um, this, this pressure drop problem. So it's, instead of this four-dimensional space, we now have this, uh, this, one, or this, this relationship just between one independent <coughs> and one dependent variable, which makes it much, much easier to obtain results. Um, now, it's, it's a little bit murky, usually. I know I had trouble at first conceptualizing how you go from this unknown relationship, right? If we don't know it, how do we know we can reduce it down to this simple one? Um, and that's what we're going to start doing 
next week when I introduce what's called the Buckingham Pie Theorem. But for now, I just want to like give you the I want to give you the time to kind of mull over what this means and, and give you some examples of why this is good and try to to give you a better intuitive sense of what we're going to be doing instead of diving into the, the theory directly. Uh, so is a little little exercise here. Uh, we're going to verify that these two parameters here are in fact without any dimensions. So go and pull out a go out pull out a pen. Uh, there was a U to the left. Division point here. All right, from uh, like Andrew over this way and Joey over that way. On this side, go ahead and come up with the dimensions for that. And on this side, come up with the dimensions of that. Uh, I'll just remind you here that, for example, if you look at mu here, the fluid density, this is usually given in units of. Like Newton seconds per meter squared. So that's your, that's your hint. Alright, for this first dimensionless group right over here, um, how are you guys writing the uh, term on top here? Remember, our dimensions are, you can use either mass, length, time, or force, length, time. These two are both sufficient to describe. Yeah. Um, well, we got for D is drag, right? D here is diameter, actually. Oh, diameter. Okay, yeah, well, yeah. Um, Sorry. <laughs> for, for delta P, I had uh, ML over T squared over L squared because it's pressure, right? Uh, ML, you said ML over T squared? Yeah, over all over L squared, so DL cancel out. Okay. No, and okay. diameter is just going to be a length, right? <coughs> so. So these two things are going to give us, then we've got L squared, L squared, so we should have, I haven't done this myself yet, so there, I, we'll, we'll catch any mistakes that come up together. Um, mass over time squared, and on the bottom. Uh, on the bottom we have, uh, for rho we have mass over L cubed. Okay. And for... Oh, this should that be velocity. Oh, so, that was velocity. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, meters per second. So it's uh, length uh, squared over time squared. Right. All right. So that leaves us with. <clears throat> Oh, because it's rho per, or pressure drop per length. Yeah, pressure drop per length. We are missing an L. Um, mass length times squared. Oh, it's pressure drop per length. Yeah. 
Length, mass, length per time squared per. So that should be an L cubed there, if I'm not right or wrong. L over L. L. Yep. Alright, so that leaves us with now on the bottom here, we'll put an L. That leaves us with mass uh, over L over times squared, so we have cancel that, cancel that, cancel that, cancel that, cancel that, cancel that, nothing. Yeah, so this means it doesn't matter what system of units we use. Do it, you, you know, imperial units or metric, have your pick, and we should get the same, at least, uh, sorry, the same Output, not dimensionalization. Let's look at this side now. Let's do volunteer enumerator. <coughs> so rows and over L cube. And then V's L over T. So L T negative one. And then All right, so here we got mass canceling out. We've got L to the negative 3, L, L, so that leaves us with a single L um, ne to the negative 1. So that leaves us with a cancel that, cancel that, negative 1. Negative one times the negative two times time gives us time to the negative one, and so that cancels, that cancels, that cancels, that cancels, and leaving us with again no units. So um, as I said, the, the 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 beauty of this relationship is is subtle, and it may take you guys a while to appreciate it. But think about where we see this. Uh, you know, all over the place as naval architects. You guys heard about Froude's hypothesis before? This is what allows us to do model testing on ships, right? So, um, if you think about the fact that a ship, the drag on a ship may be some component of, well, I don't know, may depend on its speed, the size of the ship, the, the uh, viscosity and density of the fluid, the gravitational acceleration, um, then, then you end up with this very complex relationship involving, uh, I don't remember exactly how many variables, but in the end, we're able to say, oh, look at this. I can say that my drag coefficient, as it's called, which is the total drag over uh, <laughs> one-half rho v squared times the wetted surface area is some function of the Reynolds number and fruit number. Right? And so this comes directly from, and we'll, and we'll do this example um, at the beginning of next week, uh, this comes directly from following the same sort of process where we take an unknown relationship but then manipulate it somehow that we're allowed, in, in some way that we're allowed to do and uh, come up with something that's much easier than to experimentally determine what this relationship is. So the crux of it, and I want to hammer this in, is that if we left it in its original form, it's really hard, for example, to come up with a mathematical regression. Right, a mathematical fit. 
that describes this, the relationship between all of these different variables and the output. Much, much easier to do a mathematical uh, regression through a single curve. Now, so you, you, know, you could just dump these values into Excel, fit your trend line to it, and there you have a, an empirical model that describes the pressure drop through a pipe. Um, so we just went ahead and did this. Okay, so this brings us to the idea of uh, similitude. Now, similitude tells us when we are allowed to perform a test on a model of a system, and we can, we can be confident that the results of that test represent the system we're interested in. For example, we rely on similitude when we say, I want to understand what the, uh, the sea keeping characteristics of the ship are. So I'm going to de uh, design a model, take it into the wave tank, and run it through some sea keeping tests with a towing tank. Um, in order to have any confidence in knowing that we're getting meaningful data out of our small sc or scaled model, we have to go through these checkpoints to make sure that we are satisfying the similarity requirements between our model scale and our full scale. So for modeling, we generally say we have a prototype, which is our real world, in this case, like our ship. Right? We have our model, which can be, in this case, physical, but model, modeling as a field also encompasses things like simplified equations or numerical setups such as CFD. Okay? But we're going to be talking about physical models here. Um, and the similarity parameters are those things that we know we want to observe in the experiment that impact the, uh, the results for the prototype. For example, um, if we're looking at geometric similitude. This requires that our model be a, be a scaled down version or scaled up version of whatever we're looking at in real life. That means all the lengths of it have to scale by the same ratio. All of the angles have to remain the same. So if I'm looking at testing some blob, right, then I better be sure that my model blob is geometrically similar to this in the sense that if I were to blow this up by some constant ratio in all dimensions, it's going to look exactly like this one. Um, from a, a, a geometric perspective, a good way to remember this is that um, you should have all learned back in high school geometry the idea that two similar triangles are those with equal angles, right, but different side lengths. So we can say that if this has a 45 degree angle, this is 1, this is 1, this is square root of 2, and I want to make it larger but geometrically similar, I want to say make this 3, 3, make this square root of 18. This tells us that the ratio of this side length to this side length is equal to the ratio of this side length to this side length, which is equal to the ratio of this hypotenuse to this hypotenuse, and that the 45 degree angle is the same. Um, this is really important for doing physical modeling. That's why you see this painstaking detail going into creating ship models that look like exact miniatures of the things we're trying to simulate. Right? Um, the harder part about this, you know, this is easy, but the harder part about geometric similitude is this doesn't only involve like large scale features, you know, um, this also involves very small scale ge geometric features like surface roughness, all right? If you're interested in the drag on a ship, you can bet that all those rivets you got poking out of the hole are affecting it. And so if you wanted to come up with a perfect geosim, that is a, a model that's geometrically similar, you'd better scale down all those little roughness elements and include those in your, in your scaled model. Um, all right, so kinematic similitude then is, tells us that um, 
displacements, velocities, and uh, usually accelerations, right? Those, those quantities that describe the motion of something um, have to be equal between our, uh, they have to be, from the model scale to the full scale, have to be equal across all of the quantities. For example, uh, that tells us that if, um, trying to think here, uh, this tells us that if this is going in, if this has uh, two velocity components, right, u and v, with a, then a total velocity vector, that tells us our model scale better have u m equal to some, we'll say some scale factor, alpha, times u, then vm better be equal to alpha v, and the total velocity vector better be equal to alpha times the full scale velocity vector. It tells us that all the velocities have to scale by the same factor, and that satisfies kinematic similitude. Um, and the last one is dynamic similitude. And what this tells us is that, you know, if this is something, we did a really messed up ship hull, right? Then it's going to have different components of force acting on it. It's going to have gravity, it's going to have viscous forces, it's going to have pressure forces. So let's go ahead and say that this thing's got um, weight acting on it. We'll say that it's got force of pressure and, um, I don't know, force, viscous forces. Then, just as in this case, we, we expect to see that the same forces show up on this and that the ratio of gravitational forces here would be some other scale factor, we'll say beta times weight. Say this one is then beta times F viscous, and this would be beta times F pressure. All of the incident forces on a body have to scale by the same factor, and that satisfies dynamic similitude. So what this means is, um, for us as, as naval architects, is in general, forget about kinematic similitude for a moment. Right? It's kind of hard to, to, to design that into a problem. But um, if you have a geometrically similar model to, that simulates a ship hull, and you have a, a good, good way of preserving the ratios of forces on your model, then with the same force components, that is, this, this includes inertial forces, pressure forces, viscous forces, anything that, that, that's causing pushing and pulling on something, if you have a geometrically similar model with dynamically similar forces, then what follows is you'd expect your streamlines and streak lines and flow patterns to be the same between the model and full scale, which means that you get kinematic similitude out of dynamic and geometric similitude. Um, this is sort of a subtle point, but an important one. And we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this more later. I'll, I'll, we'll keep bringing up the idea of, is this a geometrically similar model, is this kinematically similar, dynamically similar, etc. So, um, a couple examples of where we see this in play. Uh, this is kind of a cool problem, where usually when you see a scale model, right, ships, model trains, cities, you're saying, oh my god, the system's too big, I need to shrink it down to study it. The opposite is also true. So this is a study where they were interested in understanding what happens with low Reynolds number flow around the wings of insects. So they said, we're going to study this fruit fly. So in this video, first thing you'll see is a high-speed video of a fruit fly taking off in flight. And the subject of the aerodynamics of insect flight is actually very rich in the literature. A lot of people have studied uh, how bugs stay airborne. And the way they did this one experimentally was they blew up a model of a fruit fly, 
while keeping it geometrically similar. In order to maintain dynamic similarity, that is the ratio of pressure forces to viscous forces, etc., what they did is they put it in a different fluid, in this case mineral oil. Right? Um, and by, by, by playing with the way they preserved the dimensionless parameters involved in the problem, they were able to get meaningful insight into how a small bug flies in the air using a big robot bug in thick mineral oil. Example closer to home, as I've said, is ship model testing. So in order to get meaningful results here, as I said, we need to scale the geometry well, that is, we need to expect that the angles on the hull everywhere are equal, and that all the lengths, uh, all the distances on the hull scale equally. And we want to expect that the ratio of viscous to pressure forces, that is wave, wave uh, resistance to dr uh, frictional drag to the model's own inertial component, are all equal. So we have their geometric similarity in the model, and dynamic similarity in the way we run the experiments. And uh, have you guys ever been to the MHL before, to the towing tank? All right, I didn't realize it at first, but this uh, video is, is our tank here, um, quite a while ago. But spent many, many hours on that carriage. Okay, I've also crashed that carriage. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, I think we're probably going to be finishing up a little bit early, but before you all start packing up, uh, I want to leave this off where we're going to be picking up next time, which is the idea of the Buckingham Pie Theorem. So, if you're anything like I was in your position, you're kind of like, what is he talking about right now? He's just talking about taking these complicated problems and turning them into less complicated problems by magic. Um, dimensionless, dimensional, similitude, etc., etc. It all kind of boils down to something that I hope, I hope next week when we get into this, you'll sort of say, aha. The idea is, if we take a problem that has dimensional parameters, right? This could be drag, this could be velocity, diameter, uh, viscosity, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. The idea is that these are the baseline um, variables of a problem that we're interested in. Then, usually, what we do if we're doing experiments with a model is we sit down and we just sort of brainstorm. All right, here are the variables that I think are going to affect the problem. You don't limit yourself, you say, I think viscosity is going to affect this, let's throw viscosity in there. I think the fluid density will affect this, let's throw the uh, density in there. Then, by applying this theorem here, which says, um, well, I'll, actually, I'll come back to this in a moment. By applying the Buckingham Pi theorem, what we do is we group these variables into dimensionless terms that we call pi terms. So each of these pies here have no dimensions. Just like the fruit number, or the Reynolds number, or that pressure drop problem we did before. Um, in, in the problem we did before, this would have been the pressure drop um, coefficient, and over here would have been the, uh, I don't know, what was the expression, uh, the, the rho v d over mu. Um, and we can, we know how many pi terms we're going to derive using this expression here. So the, the uh, I want to pick apart, there we go, the Buckingham Pi Theorem. Um, I want to sort of rephrase this a little bit more diagrammatically. So if we have some functional relationship, we say, um, if we come up with something that says uh, our variable of interest, let's say y is equal to a, very, a function of x1, x2, dot, 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 dot. Oops. x, k. A 
This is dimensional. Now, let's say that applying something like a mass, length, time description, it requires it requires r of these dimensions to describe everything in this problem. So if we've got like a mass and we have a length and we have a time, already we require all three. But remember, one of the first things I said in class uh, in this class was all of the quantities, right? The reason we use like a mass length of time or force length of time is that it allows us to break down all of the dimensional quanti quantities that we talk about into some combination of these three terms. So what, what this is asking is if you look at all of the dimensional quantities in your relationship or in your equation on both sides, on y and on x, um, how many of these dimensions do you need to describe everything that's in that solution? And so the answer to that is r dimensions. If you're interested in measuring the distance between two points, you have <coughs> Distance from here to here equals some coordinate here and some coordinate or minus some coordinate here. There you have three variables, right? Two independent coordinates, one dependent, the, the distance between them, but they all only have dimensions of length. So in that case, this would be three, this would be one, right? Um, oh, I should mention, I'm sorry, this should be k minus 1, because we have, so this tells us um, we have k terms. That includes the output and the input. All right, then what the Buckingham Pi theorem tells us is that by performing magic, which is actually just theory, we get this relationship of 1 equals some function of I k minus 1 minus r. Which means that we get a, a relationship of dimensionless pi terms and we have removed a total of r terms from the problem. <coughs> um, one last little example before I let you guys go. Uh, I want you to consider I want you to consider uh, the, the flow over a, 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 a lifting section or an, an airfoil, right? So it makes planes fly, propellers propel, rudders rud, I don't know. Um, then we'd expect, right, if this is at some angle of attack, alpha, in some flow with a velocity u. Um, let's brainstorm some of the variables we think may affect how much lift we get out of this lifting section. Right? So we may expect lift to be some unknown function of, let's start throwing them out. <coughs> There are quite a few of them. You can say almost literally anything that's in your head. You're probably right. Velocity. Velocity, yeah, you. All right. Density. Density, yep. <coughs> Density. Viscosity. I heard viscosity. I'm just going to keep writing things that you guys say. Um, pressure. How about what I wrote up here, the angle of attack, right? Generally, wings that are higher angles of attack generate more lift. Alpha. 
What about the size of the wing? It's a model airplane, can generate enough lift to keep a 747 aloft. So we call that the, the, the cord length in this case. The, the distance from here to here is what we call C. Um, all right, let's call that good for now. So the first step in the Buckingham Pi theorem would have us go through and say, all right, which of these are independent from one another? And uh, general, that was, that was, that was actually that's very good. But you could show that um, by looking at how independent these all are, you could, you could recognize, actually, that there's a relationship between lift and the pressure distribution over the cord length. And so we have three, we end up having three variables here that really only describe two parameters. And usually what people do then is they say, okay, the pressure can be expressed, or the average pressure could be expressed as, for example, the lift force divided by some area or, or, or the geometric um, extent over which that lift is distributed. So we end up with one, two, three, four, five, six variables. Okay. Nasty, nasty experimental space if you want to look at all of them independently. And so what they're able to find, and this, is, this has been well documented, is they say, um, instead you write out, using the Buckingham Pi theorem, that the lift coefficient, which is equal to lift over one half rho u squared times c, is equal to some function of the Reynolds number, which is u c over or u c rho over viscosity and the angle of attack, because angle of attack itself is already dimensionless. It turns out, and then through experiments, right? And this is this is what's great about it is it turns out a bunch of these terms aren't actually all that important for, you know, uh, for most cases. So what they found is experiments, as long as the Reynolds number is above a certain value, right, there's a point where the, its influence sort of bottoms out and it stops changing the problem. And that, that, that point is actually uh, basically any, any wings that we're interested in looking at are at a high enough Reynolds number that we don't have to worry very much about this. That's not always true. I don't want you to go around saying that Casey says the Reynolds number doesn't matter to wings because someone will slap me. Um, but what we end up getting is that the lift coefficient is a function of only the angle of attack. And then through experiments, they've gone ahead and shown that the lift coefficient ends up actually being, for a wing section like this, something like 2 pi alpha. <coughs> Pretty simple. So this is what the experiments tell us, and actually this is a problem where um, tricked you because we 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 actually can solve this using simple simple fluid flow theory. If we were to do a potential flow analysis on this, we would get the exact same result, telling us that the experiment does in fact match theory. And again, what's great about this is this tells us that. For any wing, whether it's a model airplane, if we're assuming the Reynolds number <coughs> is high enough, model airplane, or 747, or propeller underwater, or rudder, then if we know the angle of attack, we can get the lift coefficient. And if we know what the cord length and the velocity that, that operation is, what the density of the fluid it's operating it in, or operating in is then we can simply solve for, with a known, with one known value, if we know the other values in here, we can obtain the dimensional lift for that problem using this dimensionless relationship. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop it there and uh, we'll come back to this next week. Um, take a look at the, the practice problems that got posted and we, I will, uh, do you guys prefer after class on Monday or during your ordinary tutor hours on Tuesday? I guess show of hands for Monday. Show of hands for Tuesday. All right. No homework next week, so.
side of it, so it's the whole diameter for this one, and then I uh, solved and I got that. That's, it's about five millimeters, which makes sense when you think about it. You can have a candle light on that, but Five millimeters? It's about half a centimeter, right? Because uh, if the piano wire diameter is like a fifth of a millimeter, like this makes sense. That makes sense, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I went to the back and uh, 